today is International Day. I'd also like to acknowledge the aunties, the elders, the knowledge keepers, grandmothers, and matriarchs, past, present, and future, who have a critical role in sharing the culture, tradition, and values of the community. Today, we're welcoming Claudia Copley, Collection Manager of Entomology, as our speaker. For those of you who have not been to Live at Lunch before, this is a free monthly series. Each pre presentation lasts approximately one hour, and that includes time for a Q&A. Claudia has been the Collection Manager at the Royal BC Museum since 2004. She was responsible for maintaining the entomology collection, which includes insects, arachnids, and myropods. Mirapods. Mirapods, thank you. <laughs> a, a collection of more than half a million species. Each year during the summer field season, you can find Claudia exploring an area of British Columbia with collecting equipment in hand, furthering our understanding of insect diversity, diversity of the province. Please welcome Claudia. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I really appreciate you coming inside on such a beautiful day, but it's sort of appropriate to learn about pollinators. Spring is so close. It's here actually, because the birds are singing. So it's definitely here. And I've seen some native flowers blooming. So it's definitely time for spring. <clears throat> and also thank you, Kim, for the territory acknowledgement. I might reference it again later in the talk, but I'm gonna try very hard to keep to the time. So I have 50 slides, and that's a lot. So, um, well, I'll just, I, I just wanna say that pollinators includes more than just bees. And I just wanna also um, highlight what pollination actually is. It's a very simple thing that's critical. And it, you gotta talk into this and look, it's hard. <laughs> this is the male um, organ on the, on the flower, the anther producing pollen, and it needs to get to the female structure the, um, on, the, on another plant, or even the same plant onto the stamen of this plant. So it can be a self-fertile thing, but it isn't necessarily an out, um, outcrossing is always better genetically. So that's why pollinators are so important for plants. They're also critically important for us. So Whole Foods put together this um, uh, little story about how much of the produce you wouldn't get if you went to a Whole Foods and pollinators weren't available. And it's probably actually a little more extreme than that because you can't propagate a plant without it being pollinated because that's the seed product. So um, it's important to remember that this affects us a great deal. And I think most people are aware of that, which is why we have a fairly decent turnout today. And I often get a lot of questions about pollinators. Some different things pollinate besides bees. Wind is very common. So anyone who has allergies to willows and alders and oaks, those are all wind pollinated plants and they have uh, flowers that are very simple looking, often green and often dangly so that they, the wind really rips through them. All the conifers, of course, are also wind pollinated. And then water, any aquatic plants, utilize, they often utilize the water just to transport the pollen to another another plant in the water with them. But they do, some of them do use pollinators as well. And then bats, in British Columbia, we have 16 species of bats and none of them pollinate because they're all insectivorous, which means they eat insects. You have to go further south for the tropical bats that do the pollination. So if I show you all these different beautiful orange, red, pink, tubular, what, what will you tell me pollinates these plants? Hummingbirds. hummingbirds, yeah. And here in this region, we have two species of hummingbirds, the rufous and the anise hummingbird. And the rufous hummingbird is due back any minute. There may be some even back, but this is a migratory bird. So I'm gonna show you the, the root. So if you know what a rufous hummingbird looks like and you've seen them at your bird feeder, think of that little bird flying all the way to Mexico every year. And not only do they do that that year, but there are recaptures of banded rufous hummingbird <clears throat> that have lived more than eight years. So it's really phenomenal that that high energy life 
they managed to do that flight. They don't ride on Canada geese, which used to be the prevailing <laughs> god. Uh, and uh, and yeah, they're declining across their range. So they're down about 40% in their population. Not declining is the Anna's hummingbird. And in our region, in fact, it's increasing. And I think this map is quite a bit out of date, even though I did get it from Cornell's website. Uh, so we have the Anna's hummingbird here year round here in Victoria and as far north as sort of Nanaimo and the lower mainland. And both of these species go to those sorts of flowers that I showed you, but also they eat insects both species, and they feed their young exclusively insects. So if I show you this picture, what do you think I'm going to talk about next? The beetles. The beetles. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> uh, so I have included some of the common families that spend time on flowers. Beetles are kind of bumbling and clumsy, and they're not intentionally collecting pollen, but they're getting a snack. Pollen is really um, protein rich and they might even nectar if they manage to do that. But they also like flowers for places to meet and make more beetles. So you might see that quite a bit on a, bee, on a flower. Uh, so these are some of the families and flowers that are pollinated by beetles tend to be easy to land on because they're pretty clumsy. And they also can have some fragrances, let's just say, that aren't always delicious. But they don't have to be bad smelling. Um, but they definitely have to be easy to land on. Insects that don't have any trouble landing on something are flies, and they're really important pollinators. We don't give them the credit we should. In the Arctic, or as you move northward in British Columbia, and as you go up in elevation, so into the alpine regions, I almost only encounter flies during the pollination work in that area. And so people expect bees, but it's really hard to be a bee in a cold environment. Bees are warm weather animals. And so the flies take the, the terrible weather a lot better than the bees do. The flower flies or the hover flies are the most common and they fool everybody. Every time I show somebody one, they're like, oh, look at that bee. And I'm like, no, it's a fly. And so the trick is the antenna and the eyes, big eyes that touch and short antenna are characteristic of flies and um, a bumblebee or honeybee you might, you might recognize, but some of the native bees are much trickier and they look like flies, but they have longer antenna. <clears throat> and then the bee fly, if I have time, I'd like to come back to that one. Remind me if I forget, or if there's no time, don't remind me. But um, <laughs> the bee fly, if you have a bee fly in your garden, if you see a bee fly in your garden, you're winning, okay? You're winning on a make, making habitat for pollinators. I won't tell you why just yet because I don't want you to know. I don't want you to be biased against them. I want you to love them because I think they look like flying pussy willows. And actually, one time, and this is good too, one time I had somebody say, I don't know how to describe what I saw, but something came up to me. And the only way I can describe it is I saw, do you know Harry Potter? And I'm like, of course I know Harry Potter. And he said, I saw a snitch. And I'm like, oh, I know what you saw. You saw a bee fly. And sure enough, now I think of them also as snitches. And anyone doesn't know Harry Potter, that's totally useless bit of information. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and then, so I want to talk about butterflies. Butterflies are well loved. And uh, I don't have a hard sell. Whenever people say I hate insects, I go, oh, really? You hate butterflies? And they're like, oh, no, not butterflies. So they're insects and they're marvelous. They're terrible pollinators, but they're really gorgeous. So let's appreciate them. They, they mostly nectar, so they're not intentionally or unintentionally moving very much pollen. If they have a relatively hairy body, they might move the pollen, but mostly they're coming to flowers for nectar. So this Western tiger swallowtail is on morning, um, mock orange, which is a native plant here that's very fragrant and that the butterflies really love. Speaking of things butterflies love, if I told you that there was one plant, one plant, put it in your yard, make sure you have it, to get five different species of butterflies. I'm curious what you would say. I can predict it, but I'm curious. Well, I got it right. <laughs> yeah. And everybody's like, what? What? Okay. So if you want to do right by butterflies, you need to plant what butterfly caterpillars eat, not what butterflies nectar on. And that's the trick. Everybody plants a butterfly garden for adult butterflies. 
they can fly far distances and they only need nectar, so it's not that particular. But a Western tiger swallowtail needs to lay its eggs on a willow. And if you don't have willow in your landscape, then you're not going to get Western tiger swallowtail. And if you don't have nettle in your landscape, you won't get any one of these five butterflies because all of their caterpillars eat nettle. Nettle itself is wind pollinated. So you can even see in the picture of it that there's really green flowers all dangly, classic wind pollination. But all these species require nettle. So it's the one plant. Sometimes I bring nettle and give it away and somebody always wants it after they've learned this. So also moths are important. There aren't, I think there's probably a couple hundred butterflies in British Columbia and more than 2000 Lepidoptera, which is the moths and the butterflies. So there are a lot more moths and some of them are really important in terms of pollination. Like the sphinx moths are pretty, pretty targeted with their host plant. Um, but also many of them visit and nectar, but they do it at night. So we don't see them and they don't get a lot of credit but they're out there. And for butterflies and moths, you have to put up with these. So this great green, hairy, horny thing is a caterpillar of a sphinx moth. So if you find this and you squish it, then you're killing a sphinx moth, which was a beautiful, almost hummingbird-like moth that was coming to your flowers the day before. So you really need to stop squishing caterpillars. It's very important. <laughs> Leave them, the chickadees and the nuthatches will eat them. And what they don't eat will turn into butterflies and moths and things that we want in our landscape because they're part of our biodiversity here. They're pollinators. But when it really comes down to pollinators, but everybody knows our bees. And bees are exceptionally good pollinators. They're totally designed for it. They're vegetarian wasps and they get all their protein from pollen. This though, European honeybee, the name gives it away. This is the thing that everybody talks about all the time, the European honeybee. So we don't need to save this animal. We do use it, we treat it like um, livestock. So we move them all over the country. They do all kinds of pollination work for us. They don't get treated very well. Uh, sometimes they really suffer but they um, are not native, they're not indigenous to this region. And so I don't fuss about European honeybee. I have kept the honeybees before, I don't recommend it. <laughs> it's hard and uh, especially harder now. And the diseases that they have are transmitting to our native pollinators. So that's a real issue that we wanna try to avoid. So let's talk about the native pollinators. There are about 20,000 species of bee in the world, and they look very unbee-like in many cases. So what you think of as a bee, you might not see here in this. You might not think, ooh, that's a bee, but it is. And so is this, but then there's the familiar bumblebees. And I think there is a honeybee on here. Oh no, it's just close, close. So bright greens, all different colors, all different sizes, all different shapes. And I just wanna show you this first. Sometimes people say, well, this is a very common question for me. How many species of bee are there in British Columbia? And I'm just gonna say almost 500 species of bee because this was published, where's my pointer? All right. This was published just last year and it's a new bee for British Columbia. So we are still finding bees in this province that we didn't know occurred here. Newly described species or new occurrences of species that are known from other places. So we do need to keep that as a moving target, that number, but I still think 500 species is probably pretty surprising for most people, especially when you think about what you're seeing in your yard or in places like the Bouchard Garden. So what makes a bee? This is the smallest bee in North America. This is the face of the largest bee in North America. Bees come in lots of sizes and shapes. This is what makes a bee a bee, hair with hairs. So somewhere on the body of any bee are hairs that are plumose, like a feather and have hairs. 
And that is intentional in evolution, in, in an evolutionary sense, to capture pollen. So they're stickier and pollen sticks to those hairy hairs. That's what you need to look for. So that can be pretty tricky when you're out in the wild looking for hairs that have hair. <laughs> this is, a, you know, a very close up photo. <clears throat> uh, so I'm going to start with a very familiar family for most people. The honeybees are also in the apidae, uh, but the bumblebees are what we really love. Everybody knows and recognizes, for the most part, the bumblebees. And um, in British Columbia, we have about 35 species of bumblebee, but that does change because there's further recognition of new species that we used to think were subspecies, that sort of thing. And I often get asked, which one was the one with the orange bum? <laughs> I'm like, ah. So there are a lot of orange bums on this poster. And this is the Western, uh, this are the Western species. There's a poster just like this for Eastern North America. And it also has a lot of orange bums. And you can see that different species mimic each other. And they also have worker, queen, and male casts. And worker bees can look really different within one hive. They can have different color variations. So it really isn't easy to tell you which is the orange bummed one. But what I can tell you is that if you wanted to learn how to identify them, you would need to look at their face very close under a microscope. So over here, you can see that you have to look at the length of the malar um, cheek on the bumblebee. So that's not even easy from a photograph. Uh, experts do become experts after many years of experience. And there are people that if I'm sent a photograph, I can send the photograph on to experts like Corey Sheffield at the Royal Saskatchewan Museum. And he can do many of them, but he doesn't do all of them, even though he is considered a, an expert in North American bumblebees, but a world expert as well. So just to keep that in mind, we're not, it's not so much incompetence as challenge. So I'm gonna introduce you to two bumblebees that I would like you to learn. These two bumblebees have switched places. The yellow-faced bumblebee in, 19, in the 1990s was known from one record in a Soyuz. And then all of a sudden, it became our most common bee. If you look at your bumblebees in your garden, this is the bumblebee you'll see. So that sounds like a success story because in the 90s, it was put on a list of potential endangered species candidates because it was known from such a small amount of records. And now it's everywhere. And this one, the Western bumblebee is nowhere. So what happened, so there's a lot of posters and information about the Western bumblebee, and you can learn more about it online. It does look similar, but it doesn't have a yellow face. The yellow face bee has the yellow face, but I do want you to watch out for this one. It's got the white bum and otherwise looks remarkably like the yellow face bee. So if you see this, that's a notable record. In all of its range, in the lower mainland and Vancouver Island and mm, the West Soyuz Okanagan area, this species is in decline. It's really unusual to find one, <clears throat> but you still can. Um, in the Kootenays, it's still okay. So there's some areas where it's doing relatively well. And there are a number of possibilities about what happened with this, but most likely is the introduction of disease from the greenhouse industry in the lower mainland, Eastern bumblebees were taken to Europe and worked on as a pollinator for greenhouses and then brought back from Europe and released into greenhouses in the lower mainland and on the island. And they came back with diseases that our bees here had never been exposed to. And although they were released inside greenhouses, the doors were opened and the vents were opened and they moved out. And now you can find Eastern bumblebee pretty readily, even here on Vancouver Island. So the diseases transferred, probably they're very closely related to the Eastern and the Western bumblebee. The diseases would have transferred and the Western bumblebee had had no previous exposure. And so they weren't doing very well. The good news that I think is good news, and I'm sure you all too, is that there are still some. 
So they are surviving and those survivors will go on and pass on the, the ability to survive those diseases, hopefully. Do they have a favorite uh, reading uh, food? Or do they have food or places they like to? Well, I'm going to show you how bumblebees nest, and then you can think about how you can help them that way. So in the fall, or near the end of a, a bumblebee nest cycle, new queen bumblebees are produced, and so are males. And they fly, mate, the males die, and those queens overwinter as mated queen bumblebees under a log, in an old abandoned bird's nest or an old rodent burrow, and they spend the winter tucked away by themselves. And then in the spring, not too long from now, any day, you'll see your first bumblebees. That Those first ones you see are mated queens, and they're on their own. So they need to find their very favorite thing, which is an abandoned rodent burrow, because it's good, full of all the soft, fluffy material that the rodent brought in. Um, they like to nest in there. And so they'll find a hole and go in and find the nest and they'll make small eggs, egg cells. They'll produce the first generation of workers. That female, that queen bumblebee has to go out and collect all the pollen that she's gonna feed those larvae until they are pupating and coming out as workers. So she has to do all that work all on her own at first. And that is the most vulnerable stage. So if the weather turns really terrible or she gets hit by a car, that's the end. So we need slower speeds on roadways and better weather. I can't control that. So, <laughs> so we'll, work, we'll worry about the car speeds. Think of the, about the bumblebees when you're ripping through the neighborhoods. And then the um, next generation of worker bees will come out now and they will do the pollen collection and the nectar collection. And they don't, um, they don't, she doesn't have to go out anymore. Her role now is laying eggs. So she does that until near the end of the season for that hive. And then she produces more queens, more work, more males, mate over winter, the cycle continues. So a bumblebee nest is one year. So not really, it's months. A, an adult queen mated bumblebee about a year. That's her life history. A worker, just a few weeks probably. And um, they get smaller, the workers get smaller as the season progresses. So sometimes you see really tiny workers and that's because that hive is starting to slow down and probably isn't gonna last much longer. So you can create um, a hive-like object. I don't know if it's ever worked for anyone, but I found this design online. Give it a try. Definitely uh, provision it with an abandoned rodent burrow. If you find a rat's nest or something, and um, birds nests, sometimes some nest boxes get used. That's one species of bumblebee that uses nest boxes. So it likes the soft fluff from the chickadees and things like that, that had used it the year before. I'm gonna introduce you to a few other families of bees now. The mining bees now for identification, they have what are called facial fovea, which are these depressions in their cheeks. And that's not an easy feature to see in the wild. So it will be difficult for you and most people to tell the difference between the different species within the different families that I'm gonna cover. I just want you to be aware that they're out there, but they're called money bees because they burrow into the ground and they lay their eggs in chambers. And this is all done by one bee by herself. So she's not a hive. She is an individual and she creates one tunnel with the chambers off the sides and lays eggs. She provisions each egg with pollen and then that's the end of that. She moves on to lays another egg and provisions it with pollen. Okay, so the mining bees, they don't, so they're not social like the honeybees, 60,000 in a hive, or the bumblebees up to 200 in a hive. These are solitary bees. Now they do nest communally though, because the conditions are perfect in a particular place, then you'll see a lot. And the coletids make this weird plastic-like material that lines their um, tunnels. These bees also are solitary nesters, which is the typical of most. To identify them, you have to look at their tongue. They have a bilobed tongue. So that, again, is not an easy feature. And then the last family that I'm gonna talk about um, just right here is the helictus, the sweat bees. And again, they're ground nesting solitary bees. 
And the reason that I've lumped them all together is because they're what we call the pollen pants bees. They look like they're wearing chaps uh, when they've collected pollen. So they've got those big baskets on their legs and that's how they stuff pollen into it. And that's how they bring it back to their larva. Well, the egg, because they're not feeding the larva, they're just provisioning it. And then there's the pollen belly bees. These are the megachylids, the leaf cutter bee, the mason bees. These are ones you might know. You might even have a mason bee box at home that you bought, maybe you even bought pupa to get, or uh, yeah, pupa to go with, with it. You release pupa. Uh, the cycle for these guys, again, most of them are ground nesters, and I'm going to em emphasize that yet again many times more. Uh, but there are the ones like blue, blue orchard bee or mason bee that use um, what would have been a, a beetle exit hole in a tree. So they come back after a beetle has left the tree and they lay an egg, provision it with pollen, put a little barrier and lay an egg, provision it with pollen. So that's what's shown here. And that's the egg, there's the big pollen, and this is the little barrier of mud that they use. The leaf cutter bees are responsible for these perfect spheres out of your rose plant. It's not bad, it's really great. And they glue them together and put them underneath. They make this little, container basically under the ground. So let's talk about what you can do to help pollinators. It's the same thing that everybody needs, us and them, and that's food, water, and shelter. Water can be very simple. It just needs to be a damp place for things like butterflies to, to puddle. But if you want your blue orchard bees to have mud, because they need that to partition off their eggs, then you need to also provide some sort of muddy spot if you can. And then uh, this, is, this is the critical one. You need to plant native plants. If you don't have native plants in your landscape, you're not encouraging native wildlife. And uh, they're gorgeous. So there's nothing wrong with planting native plants. We don't all have to have tulips. And they're every size of flower, every color, every shape has its own pollinators. And you can have this diversity that we seek when we're gardening. People want lots of color and they want a long season. Those are all, you can get all those things out of native plants. And add some layers to your landscape. This is the worst case scenario for wildlife. Anybody who has this landscape really shouldn't live in a house. They should live <laughs> in a condo because they are not doing anything, even for their own mental well, well-being. I think maintaining a lawn like that must be very stressful. And be less of a neat freak. So, for instance, give you a chance to read it. That guy looks angry, doesn't he? <laughs> uh, leave the leaves. This is the easiest thing you can do. You don't have to, sh what I see every year is I see everybody clearing their yard and throwing it all out on the street so it gets sucked up by Saanich or some other municipal government. And then they chop it all up and then they give it back to us as mulch. But you could just rake those leaves right onto the beds uh, if you really have a lawn. Um, and the reason why I'm saying that is one of our endangered butterfly species here, the Propertius duskywing, it lives in the leaves that have fallen from the oak tree. And if you take those leaves and shove them to the road and they get chopped up into a million pieces, then that endangered butterfly doesn't make it. So you can do that. You can leave the leaves and you'll be doing a lot of favors for pollinators. You can go crazy like this person obviously is and <laughs> build, you know, the crazy condos. Um, but you don't have to because if you have a landscape that can accommodate it, leave a dead tree, hugely important for wildlife. Create a brush pile. That's about the easiest thing you can imagine doing. And then also don't be so tidy. Again, that guy, that angry guy, don't be him. In the fall, when you're really tempted to tidy all the little hollyhock stems or whatever it is, leave them because over winter, there might be critters overwintering in them. And if you leave them as long as you can, you just have to repress your inner German, which is what I have to do. Don't tidy. And then I've said it, and I'm going to say it again and again, that 70% of our native bees nest in the ground. So you can put up all the mason boxes you want, but you are not accommodating most of the diversity here. And they really need some bare ground that's slightly disturbed, but not all turned over all the time. 
and definitely not mulched, not landscape clothed. They can't live there. So it might keep your yard super tidy and be easy, but it's not so lovely. Every choice you make, try to make organic choices. So when you're grocery shopping, buy organic as often as you can. And remember to, if you ask at a garden center, so it was discovered that uh, the systemic pesticides like neonicotinoids were found in horticultural plants that were sold at garden centers. And the reason why that is so bad is when bees go to a plant that has a systemic pesticide, in other words, that pesticide is throughout the entire plant's tissue. So it, it, won't, it will kill anything that eats it. And you think, well, bees don't eat the leaves, but they feed the pollen to their babies. And the pollen is a plant tissue. So you're basically poisoning the next generation of bees when you have poisons in your plants. And so ask if you're gonna buy horticultural plants from Home Depot or wherever. And if they can answer that they aren't full of neonicotinoids, I would not buy them. Lights, poor moths, how do they get through a night? So much distraction. So remember street lighting or all those sort of automated lightings, all the lighting that we don't need. You'll save yourself a lot for hydro bills and also do a lot for insects. Cats, these are all my cats. And these are a previous generation of cats that I've had. Like I am a crazy cat lady, there's no doubt but I keep them in, so you could too. They look pretty content. People are always like, that is so cool. And I think, what about all the apartment dwelling people? They keep their cat in, nobody gets all fussed about that. But as soon as you have a landscape, then they're like, let it out. So I walk a cat on a leash now, very embarrassing <laughs> for both of us. <laughs> and uh, this, is a, this is not a trivial issue, the loss of pollinators, particularly bees. I keep this poster in the top because I like people to see all the invested interest in this. That's a lot of logos on that poster. And then I just love this one because it makes me laugh. If you want to learn more about native bees, there is a native bee society of British Columbia. And I should have said earlier, but I can say it now because it's on the slide, that the greatest diversity of bees in all of Canada occurs in the Okanagan. And that is amazing and remarkable, but if you've ever been to the Okanagan, you'll see that it's full of historically fruit trees. Well, historically, historically awesome antelope brush, sagebrush, grassland ecosystem. But now uh, it was fruit trees for a hundred years and fruit trees are bee pollinated, but probably not accommodating many of the little tiny native bees. But now they're vineyards and vineyards are wind pollinated. So that's real devastation on a highly diverse region of our province for bees and other things. It's a very cool area. And then if you also want to choose plants for the region, I happen to have up here the lower mainland plants because Jenny is videoing me and it might go everywhere. <laughs> but there is one for Victoria too. Pollinator Partnership Canada has put together a plant guide and it's native plants, what kind of um, habitats they like, full sun, partial shade, how much water, plant the right plant in the right place. And then you won't even have to maintain it. You can be a hammock, a hammock lying, enjoying your yard, never have to mulch or do anything again. Plant native plants, super easy. And then the Xerxes Society is out of the US, but it is like, perfect place to go for more information about all insects and other invertebrates as well. It's just a remarkable society for conservation of invertebrates. And I'll take questions. And while I do, I'll leave this poster up, which summarizes some of the things you can do for gardens, for wildlife. 